uh, delighted also to welcome my next guest to talk about the CAS uh, review into NHS treatment of children who believe they are trans. And that is Maya Forstatter, who's the executive director uh, of Sex Matters, the fantastic human rights charity that promotes, well, clarity about what they say, sex in law, policy and language in order to protect everyone's rights. And you've been doing that magnificently over the years. Maya, thank you for joining us. Hello, Julia. Um, I'm sure you, like me, you know, we saw a lot of the previews of what was going to be in the cash review. We had that interim report uh, a, a year or so ago. Um, welcome, well, pretty much everything that's in that cash report, don't you? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a watershed report and, and it says everything that, you know, you know and I know and the whistleblowers from the Tavistock have known for years and years, but it hasn't got out into the media and into the mainstream. Uh, and Hillary Cass put it all there with research, uh, with all the backing, um, and nobody can ignore that this is what's happened now. And that's the thing. Even the BBC that, uh, you know, that has been... I mean, I'm sorry, if you've got a kid and you don't realise that the trans stuff that's being pushed by the BBC on all their various websites and stuff aimed at kids, you, you know, you need to take a look, guys. Um, but this is the thing. There was... Reading it this morning and reading, uh, you know, all the summaries of it and going... There wasn't anything in it that I didn't already know. And I, I'm not an expert in, in uh, transgender medical care. You're not an expert in transgender medical care. So how come we knew it? And for some reason, the medics didn't know. We knew that there was no evidence for a lot of these puberty blocker treatments. Uh, we knew that there was no evidence, for instance, that treating children earlier um, uh, would, would help with their outcomes. We knew there was no evidence, no follow-ups in terms of long-term uh, impacts. Uh, we, we, knew, we, knew, uh, we knew absolutely that a lot of the children that were going to uh, seek uh, transgender care had been the victims of abuse, trauma, neglect. We know that many had a huge number, a huge percentage had autism. Uh, we knew many others had other mental health issues. We knew also an awful lot of the girls and a massive explosion from a few dozen to thousands of teenage girls thinking that they were transgender with this social contagion and YouTube videos telling girls, oh, I find my breasts and now I'm happy again. That sort of nonsense. We knew that a lot of those girls were actually just gay. Nothing wrong with being gay. No one seems to have told them there was nothing wrong with being gay. And they thought, therefore, they were a girl in a, a, a boy in a girl's body. Um, if we knew all of that, how did the medics at the Tavistock clinic, the main transgender clinic for kids, how did they not know that? And why did they ignore it for so many years? I think many of them did know it. The leadership at the Tavistock did know it. Um, they, they couldn't have not known it. One, once the whistleblowers started speaking up, I mean, they were yeah. seeing it in front of them. Um, I think other, you know, it wasn't being researched in universities. It wasn't being published in peer review studies. So other people were saying, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is just some transphobe saying this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the things that are in the CAS report, some of them are things that were investigated by uh, Michael Biggs and by Transgender Trend, you know, organisations that were um, really going against mainstream opinion and having to be quite brave to do it because none of the researchers would, were doing this. Um, so the thing that CAS did, one, she was commissioned by the government to do this, and two, she then commissioned uh, York University uh, and other researchers to look at across all of the evidence so that they could say not just that we know and we feel that this is wrong but looking at the evidence we know that there is no evidence that this yeah. um, helps children and we know that it harms them because the way that the drugs work is to sterilize um and uh, remove sexual function i mean that yeah. that's that's it working in the way that it's it's intended to yeah. um so she's put all of that down in black and white in a format that people can trust and people can't ignore anymore. And, and she has so the credentials. She's a paediatrician herself and a, a former president of the Royal College of uh, Paediatrics and uh, Child Health. I mean, she, 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 she is an expert in, in this field and understands it. But this is the thing I find amazing is these were always experimental drugs. These are, a lot of these drugs are the drugs they've used to castrate sex offenders, for goodness sake. You know, well, yeah, let's give those to kids. That seems like a good idea. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those mums who's, you know, you don't give Calpol unless you need to. And I, well, I can give you a paracetamol, but only half a paracetamol. The advice we're given in terms of being careful for, you know, children's care is huge in terms of, you know, in terms of vaccines, in terms of any sort of treatment, because we know that the bodies of children are, they're, they're, they're changing and uh, they're still developing, the impact on the brain, impact on, you know, organs like the liver and other others, that, you know, that you have to take extra care. It is extraordinary to me that 
so much research and so much experimentation has to be signed off for any other drug for children. And yet, these were experimental drugs. There was no proof they were safe. There was no proof that they did good. And yet, they were given to thousands upon thousands of children, not just here, but around uh, the world as well. Um, why, why, was, why was an exception made for these drugs? They weren't life-saving. No, absolutely. And I mean, what happened was that the Tavistock originally had a contract and a protocol for to use these drugs as an experiment. I mean, every experiment has to start somewhere. And there had been this very small experiment in the Netherlands. And the Tavistock was given the um, go ahead to prescribe these drugs to the same kinds of children who had been prescribed the drugs in the Netherlands. So children who were very gender non-conforming from, from a very early age, who had um, uh, w were, were a known group, but and, and those were mainly boys. Uh, and, but what they quickly did was expand that group, and suddenly it was mainly girls, it was teenagers, it was children who hadn't been gender non-conforming, non where, you know, this had come out of nowhere. And so they, they expanded it from being an experiment with the, that was supposed to be focused on a very small, tight group of children. And plus, they didn't run it as an experiment. They yeah. didn't follow up. They didn't collect the data. So it, was, it wasn't it was even an experiment. It was just an uncontrolled yeah. uh, testing of, of, or not even testing, but just uncontrolled giving of these these drugs to children. I mean, I mean, was, no, I mean no, the issue, and this was raised, you know, with Kira Bell's case in the High Court and, and a lot of the Tavistock people who ended up resigning because they couldn't bear working in this field anymore and, and whistleblowers, you say, spoke out that you know, children couldn't possibly consent to this treatment and have a full understanding of the implications in terms of their long-term health, in terms of their body being mutilated, in terms of their brain function being affected, as you say, being rendered sterilised, uh, uh, being unable to ever enjoy you know, sexual orgasm. I'm sorry, you know, people don't want to talk about that with kids, but how on earth at the age of 14 can you consent to that? You don't know. If you're, if you're a 25-year-old and you go to your doctor and you say, um, I'd like to be, like be sterilised, I don't want kids, they won't do it because, well, you might change your mind in your 30s. And, and yet, no, no, 14, not a problem. And parents being forced to go down this route. The thing is, the whole way through, the parents who spoke out on this were called bigots. You and I were called bigots. Everyone else who spoke out. We we're all terrible, awful people. Um, we've been proved right in, in our concerns. Um, hopefully this will stop, although private clinics still handing out puberty blockers. NHS Scotland still handing out puberty blockers. I mean, the government today should ban puberty blockers for under 18s, full stop, done. You hand those out, you're committing a criminal offence. But do you think that we need to go further than this? Do we need to have doctors struck off, losing their medical licence? Do we need to have criminal charges brought? I do think there needs to be an inquiry into what went wrong. And, it, it, you know, it's not just doctors, it's NHS decision makers, it's, it's politicians. It, you know, it's not it's not just about individual doctors. It's how how did this go wrong? Um, it, I, it, the, the CAS report is about how to fix it. But we do have to have an inquiry. Yeah. And we've still got the issue of social transitioning in schools. We're seeing reports at the weekend, even primary schools allowing, you know, little Jane to go in and say, I think I'm a boy, going to call me John, he and him pronouns. Parents discover when they turn up, you know, to a concert and, and, and little Jane is, uh, is playing Joseph at the school playing things, uh, thinks her name is John and she's a boy. And the teachers have been playing along with it. Now, that's got to stop. And again, something that was in the report uh, from Hilary Cass is, is saying that actually, you know, there's no evidence that this idea of socially, socially transitioning kids helps them in any way. Uh, absolutely. And Hilary Cass was just looking at these children who were on the waiting list for the Tavistock. She wasn't thinking about the other children in school. Yeah. So even just looking at those children, she said there's no good evidence that social transition helps. Yeah. Once you start thinking about the other children and you say, well, those children have rights too and they have rights to, uh, you know, toilets and changing rooms and sports. And, and to care. not be forced to lie. Absolutely. It's a fairly All fundamental right, that. It, once, once you say that, it, it just seems obvious that there's no ethical and safe way that you can transition any child in school, even if the doctors thought it was good for that individual child. But also, again... I liken this always to anorexia. If an incredibly painfully uh, medically skinny child came to me and said, I believe I'm really grossly overweight because I have got this mental health d uh, problem of being anorexic, I believe I'm deeply, massively overweight and I need to lose weight, will you help me? 
I wouldn't help them to lose weight because that would be wrong. And so why are we telling children, yes, you think you're born in the wrong body. There is no such thing as being born in the wrong body. There is no such thing as a boy being born in a girl's body or a girl born in a boy's body. It's not a thing. It's not real. Go out to play should be the response. Absolutely. And schools need to be telling children that. That, that, that was the one thing Cass didn't really look at with school. She looked at social yeah. media. She looked at peers. Uh, but now this is being taught in schools and that is causing harm. Absolutely. Really appreciate you coming on the show, but even more so, Maya, I appreciate the hard work you've done. You know, you lost a job and fought a battle on this in relation to women's rights, but this is this stretches across the board in society. And it's it's about reality and it's about truth and it's about our children's safety. Thank you for everything you've done. I know you'll be a hero to many of my audience. My